will now continue with the deliberations on agenda item 5E, accelerating implementation of the International Health Regulations 2005 and strengthening laboratory capacities for better health in the WHO European region. The relevant document is contained in document EUR slash RC67 slash 13 and EUR slash RC67 slash 8, which contains the final report on the implementation of the IHR in our region. We will discuss again tomorrow or maybe, uh, yeah, tomorrow during matters arising from the World Health Assembly when we will review the proposal for a five-year global strategic plan to improve public health preparedness and response. Today we will focus on our region. For our final plenary item today, or oh, maybe if we, could, we are able to continue with one, I hope so, we will first hear from Anna Kasratze from Georgia, another person of the Voices of the Region. Please start the film. My name is Anna Kasradze. I'm the Head of Public Health Preparedness and Response Division at National Center for Disease Control of Georgia. I was really very young when I, when IHR started in Georgia and when I started with it. Every day I come at work, I open my computer and the first thing I do is the check my emails, what is happening in the world. IHR gives you this opportunity to uh, get the information you need to plan your response activities very early. Because it might be happening very far from your country, but it can reach, uh, reach you within a couple of hours. I think um, IHR is the best tool to organize the chaos that happens during the emergencies. So you think you are well prepared, you think you have all the plans at place, but then the emergency arises and there is a chaos. If you want to reach the successful implementation of IHR, you should really have the good uh, communication and collaboration with other sectors. We provide Ministry of Finance with the list of uh, high-risk countries, endemic countries. We provide vaccines and Ministry of Finance is responsible on vaccinating uh, travelers from endemic countries right at the border. The general population doesn't know what is IHR. It was the same with me while I was a student. I also didn't know what was the IHR and what it stands, stands for. So, but the thing the important thing is that people feel safe. When I see people walking in the streets and I know that there are no major outbreaks happening in my country, I have this tiny feeling that I had a little, very little part in it. It is the 10th anniversary of IHR coming into force. I have feeling that now the world and the authorities now recognize that the threats from infectious diseases and um, is um, really important. We think that uh, now it's important to strengthen the preparedness capacity in the country. Um, and I have two young women working with me, young generation. I'm trying to show them that this is, the IHR is really important. You should use it in everyday life. My mom is proud, so I can see it. I can see it. She doesn't tell me personally, but I've heard her telling um, other people that she's really, really proud of me. And she mentions it all the time, so I'm happy. I'd like 
these videos very much. I think they give a very good impression uh, on the different topics. So congratulations on this idea. And I now give the floor to Dr. Nedret Emiroglu, Director of the Division of Health Emergencies and Communicable Diseases, to introduce the topic. Dr. Emiroglu, the floor is yours. No? Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, Madam Regional Director, Honorable Ministers, Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen. The document in front of you is aiming to accelerate the actions within the region uh, to be able to implement and fully comply with the IHR obligations. Let me give you a bit of story. Uh, you would remember that this has been one of the discussions during the regional COVID last year where we have presented you the uh, European Regional Emergency Plan structure and the priorities. And as requested by you, we have been working since summer last year on a document which is going to look into the European context of implementing the IHR and accelerating the core capacities. It is tailored specifically to the request and, and the needs of the countries, and it is based on uh, a broad-based consultation with the member states. It has been presented to the uh, Standing Committee for the Regional Committee in May during its open session, and has been uh, prepared under the guidance of the IHR uh, Working Group of the Standing Committee for the regional committee, which I'm grateful for. So there are some guiding principles that the document takes. First of all, its starting point is the SDGs and the Health 2020 with the leaving no one behind, and also looking into the emergency-related targets of Health 2020 and SDG. And as requested again by the European Member States, the European region is looking specifically into linking the emergency preparedness and the capacities with the health system strengthening essential public health functions. Then it takes an all-hazard approach. It's not only the infectious diseases, which is the target, but all disasters, nature or man-made conflicts and also accepts the need for multi-sectorial nature of the work that IHR requires with the whole of government approach, as well as the broadened partnership and engaging the communities with the whole of society. Broadened partnership is extremely critical and at the regional office we have been expanding our collaboration, of course first and most with the member states, but then the UN agencies, the civil society, all the stakeholders at the local level. Then it gives a special focus on to the countries. Of course, country ownership and leadership is extremely critical. And looking into the mostly the support to the high risk and vulnerable uh, countries in line with the mapping we are going through. And then overall uh, aim is strengthening the IHR core capacities for a timely detection, which is going to lead us to an effective response. The document in front of you is a technical document. It fill, fulfills the one year period uh, to be able to accelerate the actions in the region until the consultation on the WHO global draft strategic plan is finalized at the World Health Assembly, which is, as, as the chair mentioned, going to be the discussion of tomorrow. And it defines five action, priority action areas for your consideration, and I will go through them now one by one. The first area is the looking into the country implementation of the IHR. I would like to stress once more the importance of the whole of government multi-sectorial approach under the highest political leadership. Again, as I, as I was mentioning in the guiding principles, having an all-hazard uh, approach 
and the role of the national IHR focal points and how we could be able to empower them and then the most important work we do together with the Division of Health Systems is how we could link all these capacities in a long-term, sustainable, strong, resilient health systems and effective public health functions. The second is, is looking into the IHR monitoring and evaluation approaches, taking all four components of the, of the approach uh, and not uh, actually relying only on the annual reporting, but giving the uh, equal emphasis onto the simulation exercises, which we have started to conduct in the region, but also the after action reviews, which is a, a process to retrospectively assess a real event, and also some voluntary external evaluations that we have conducted uh, in, in the region, in some countries who volunteered. The real action here is development of the national action plans addressing the gaps which are costed and which are linked to the national health policies and, and preferably also national development plans and policies. And the overall system is looking for a strong chain of health security. A, a system in the country at the very local level which will be able to detect all the threats, public health threats on time, go through a very accurate and timely risk assessment and then define the, the response needed in line with that and do it in, a, in an open, transparent way, sharing the information with the health uh, professionals as well as the public. And, and we have started developing a tool. This is just a snapshot of uh, what will be coming uh, soon, together with the Division of Information, Evidence and Research, looking into capturing the essential core capacities in the countries to be able to look into where we should be focusing, using a number of assessments, exercises as an example. And the third component is a special focus into the laboratories, the functions of the laboratories. Again, this is specific to the European region, coming as a request both from the member states at the regional committee as well as the standing committee for the regional committee. And we start as, a, as, as an example using the Better Labs for Better Health initiative, which has been an example in supporting some of the countries, but it won't be restricted to this initiative only. What it requires is a cross-cutting public health laboratory function, which is going to help the epidemiology with the quality assured system, as well as the trained uh, workforce. Then, of course, the essential component is WHO being able to support you because you asked WHO to take the leadership in this area and we are starting to, to strengthen our capacities in the regional office as well as in the pri defined priority offices, looking into the WHO's readiness as well as working with the other UN agencies to be able to provide that support uh, in line and in time that you need. So this is a proposal for the next 12 months, particularly that we plan as the secretary to take some accelerated technical actions and looking forward to your guidance. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Emiroglu. Before we start with the debate, I would like to make an announcement. Um, the interpreters agreed that we could stay here for another hour this evening, which means after the debate on the IHR, um, I would like to catch up um, the governance issue, which we originally planned to and had on the agenda on Monday and which we did not cover. And the technical briefing will, um, will be held in parallel to our session here in the plenary. So then we can continue with our debate and I open the floor for the debate and ask delegations wishing to speak. Um, please raise your name plates. Switzerland, you have the floor, followed by Slovenia. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Switzerland would like to thank the regional office for its report, RC 6713, aimed to accelerate the application of the IHRs and to strengthen the capacities of our laboratories in order to improve health in our region. Switzerland welcomes the progress accomplished by Europe in the field of IHRs. The Ebola epidemic has demonstrated the importance and the need to have effective capacities in all the member states. Switzerland would like to take this opportunity to reaffirm its will to support member states to set up the IHR capacities. We invite the regional office to establish a regional action plan which conforms to the five-year global strategic plan which will be submitted to the 71st WHA in May 2018. As to the st strengthening of, cap of laboratory capacities, Switzerland at the present time is, in, is discussing with the National Center for Emerging Viral Infections so that it becomes in 2018 the National Reference Center for Measles and Rubella. It would then be integrated into the European Network for Measles and Rubella supervised by the regional office. Finally, Switzerland is very happy that its capacities for the implementation of IHRs be the object of joint ex external evaluations at the end of 2017. We're very happy to be submitted to, to be evaluated and to learn from this experience. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now give the floor to Slovenia, followed by Sweden. Thank you, Madam President. Regional Director, distinguished delegates. It is very encouraging that we have found the ways to speed up the process of implementing international health regulations. A five-year strategic plan is no doubt going to help us to better prioritize. It is also good to know we have a plan until the global plan is adopted. Implementation of international health regulations, we, I think, all agree, depends on the active involvement of other sectors. In many cases, this is where we fail in implementing not only IHR, but also other policies. The question we have to answer is how to assure appropriate understanding of shared ownership and responsibility. In Slovenia, we have since the last regional committee worked hard with the regional office and applied and tested several valuable tools to support implementation of uh, I, I, IHR. The joint external evaluation of international health regulations core capacities was performed this spring. Very timely indeed. Almost immediately after we have started to communicate to fulfill the demands of the evaluation, we were confronted with an emergency situation where the fire covered a chemical waste warehouse and 465 tons of hazardous waste was burned near Ljubljana in a populated area, including pesticides, oil filters, rubber tires, mercury, solvents, and similar. Preparing for the joint external evaluation, we were in fact preparing for a real catastrophe. Working together in the frame of joint evaluation helped us establish personal contacts and enabled us to communicate better in the real case, and thus respond with more confidence and better cooperation. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I now give the floor to Sweden, followed by Spain. Thank you, Chair. The Global Plan covers all important recommendations of the Review Committee, but much, much work remains, and we still hope that the five-year Global Strategic Plan will be more detailed and action-oriented. Sweden welcomes the development of a European plan that supports the need of the region. At global level, Sweden would like to point out the importance of all countries reporting public events that may pose international threats to health in accordance with the agreed and binding frame framework. Failure to do so undermine, undermines the entire work. Sweden supports the joint external evaluations as a tool to strengthen global implementation of IHR by ident identifying gaps and needs, preparing national emergency pre preparedness plans, and measuring progress made. 
The Public Health Agency of Sweden has participated in several JEEs with very positive experiences. And the agency emphasizes the importance that the JEEs also provide the opportunity to share experiences between countries. And it's therefore important to maintain the peer review aspect. Sweden also wishes to highlight the importance of close cooperation within the Euro, Euro region with other relevant partners, such as the EU and its framework for health security. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now give the floor to Spain, followed by Israel. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Madam Regional Director, dear colleagues. We're partners to the test, prevent, and respond to health threats, and in particular to global health threats, is the responsibility of the highest level of governments and requires cross sectoral and international collaboration. The IHR provides a unique but also the only framework for developing preparedness and response capacities in all state parties with a global all hazard and one health approach. By signing the IHR, we all step forward for a transparent share of information, collaborate and cooperate for preparing for and responding to cross-border health threats. In this context, the leadership of WHO is the key for implementing the regulations, but bilateral agreements for improving rapid detection and response to cross-border health threats, such as the agreement recently endorsed by the Portuguese and the Spanish ministers of health, is the first step to keep regional threats regional and to reduce its international impact. All state parties must implement health and security capacities under the IHR, and this implies strengthening national health security capacities by assuring robust, well-training and active national focal points, efficient surveillance, timely risk assessment, available public health control measures and access to diagnostics, vaccines and treatments. And this can only be achieved by assuring quality and stable health systems and country highest government authority commitment. Therefore, high vulnerability, low capacity countries should be a WHO priority for supporting planning preparedness and for resource allocation. An ambitious but realistic WHO plan action-oriented, adequately resourced, and with specific goals and indicators, combined with the acceleration of IHR implementation, including the four aspects, would be a cornerstone for improving global health security. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now give the floor to Israel, followed by Monaco. Thank you, Madam Chair. Israel is now committed to the implementation of IHR both nationally and internationally. National preparedness is needed for biological as well as to toxicological, radiological, and chemical events. Israel has decided and has dedicated infrastructures for dealing with health emergencies. Such events are centrally administrated by the Supreme Health Authority, which includes representatives from all key stakeholders. Israel realizes the importance of collaboration on both the national level between stakeholders and on the inter international level between nations and international organizations. Capacity development is ongoing with the commitment to cross-sectional and with international collaboration. Training is a major aspect of capacity development. In Israel, training covers all levels from the individual level to the organizational level and even interorganizational. This includes simulation, realistic scenarios, training courses, and workshops, as well as an advanced medical simulation center. We therefore recommend continued capacity development, uh, which will include sharing of knowledge and expertise, in very, is very important. Israel is already involved in training and workshops in many parts of the world. The monitoring and evaluation framework provide us with uh, concrete tools. We have been contributing to the JEEs and beyond. With regard to polio eradication, in 2013, Israel dealt uh, with wild poliovirus type 1 transmission event 
which was identified early due to routine switch surveillance, and intervention was undertaken before a single polio case has developed. This is an example of use of new tools being used to identify and preempt potential H IHR events. We suggest the use of big data system for identification, surveillance, monitoring, and intervention in IHR events. We have a trans-organizational data system connecting HMOs, hospitals, EMS, laboratories, and emergency bodies outside the health system, which could be accessed during a health emergency. Meticulous attention must be also given to cybersecurity, which is a new uh, threat today. Finally, we commend the work of the new uh, WHO emergency program and commit supporting the activities in the European region and globally. We wish to thank the Chair and the Committee for the opportunity to share some of our experience with IHR events and implementation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now give the floor to Monaco, followed by Italy. Thank you. For this. Merci, Madame. Thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, I would like to thank the Secretariat for this report and to recall that the implementation of the IHRs is a priority for our government. The report stresses that pro progress has been made in the implementation of the IHRs, but nevertheless, some progress has been limited, especially when it comes to setting up the mechanisms and the transboundary collaboration processes. And here I have the pleasure to announce that Monaco has, on the 13th of July, signed a cooperation agreement for health with France, which enables our principality to make, overcome the difficulties that they have encountered in setting up the necessary capacities required for IHRs. In actual fact, the Monaco uh, hospital, in spite of its high level of technology, cannot uh, cope with the massive in influx of uh, migrants, especially if there were an health emergency occur in the case of a sh ship coming in. And so I can only encourage health cooperation to take place between co small countries when they don't have the necessary capacities to cope with major emergencies and, ma and neighbor neighboring countries. It's in the interest of one and all. And here, Monaco would like to consolidate its preparation for health crisis and emergencies, and especially when it comes to establishing pluridisciplinary measures, especially as in the case that we had in October in 2016, in the case of plague on board a ship, and to ensure that we have the necessary material, for, for instance, new the purchase of new decontamination tents. The Principality of Monaco is prepared to participate in developing the five-year global strategic plan as defined in WHA 71 in, for the Assembly in May. And no doubt that will be discussed tomorrow as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now give the floor to Italy, followed by Norway. Thank you, Chair. No doubt the IHRs have shown their validity and strength on the front line when properly and comprehensively implemented. Italy passed through a storm of challenges over the last three years, from Ebola surveillance, including 2,000 individual screenings of passengers and staff at the airports and ports, including three emergency medical evacuations of our NGOs, health staff from Sierra Leone and Conakry, were successfully treated in Rome, to the current measles outbreak that led us passing a new law on mandatory vaccinations, two smaller and limited outbreaks of C meningitis and A hepatitis, in at-risk population groups in a few regions of the country, as well as a recent autochthonous, autochthonous case of death from cerebral malaria to finish with the identification of a dozen cases of chikungunya fever in Rome area and the now almost endemic West Nile fever that led us to waste 12% of our blood escorts. I will not report on animal health and zoonosis threats for the sake of time saving here. Italy is also a major tourist destination, and in particular, preferred destination for Mediterranean Sea cruises. We identified, isolated, and treated several hundred cases just this season on, of onboard board dangerous conditions, besides the usual food poisoning limited outbreaks. Additionally, we had to screen, diagnose, and treat half a million migrants and asylum seekers traveling by the sea to our shores. 
They were affected by various conditions that requested a doc proper and timely treatment that we, we were able to provide despite the constant emergency situation in which our first-line staff are constantly performing on board and on arrival. The rapidly changing environment in which we operate and the availability of new diagnostic procedures and technology, such as molecular techniques, allowing for fast and reliable phylogenetic diagnosis, are now suggesting the need to revise and update continuously the IHRs, considering also populations on the move, international trade intensification, <coughs> the obvious climate change induced vectors movement beyond their traditional boundaries. The true picture of circulating pathogens achieved with the adoption of molecular techniques replacing traditional laboratory diagnosis tells us that we may miss up to three times the actual diagnosis wrongly classified as negative. We've launched a special program to benchmark technologies, outputs, and financial implications that will lead us to the networking of accredited subnational laboratories in this respect. Any kind of collaboration is welcome on this. As you know, we also accepted the chair to chair the Global Health Security Steering Committee next year, ensuring continuity to the great job already done by Finland, the Netherlands, and other partners. This will allow us to work consistently on the many decision-making for, including the Health Security Committee of the European Union, where we will be able to provide all the support WHO may need to play its role, also with other regions bordering Europe. In fact, they may possibly request assistance due to the local conditions in countries in turmoil with a broken health system or where migrants and refugees impact heavily on their service delivery capacity. I want to reassure WHO and our sister countries that Italy is ready to work hand in hand, providing the support needed to make the IHR's voice loud and clear along the lines outlined in the presented documents, for which we thank the Secretariat for the great job done. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now give the floor to Norway, followed by Kazakhstan. Uh, thank you, Chair, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Norway would like to thank WHO for this document. It provides a good basis for developing a regional action plan aligned with the five-year global strategic plan. IHR national focal points have central responsibilities in the functioning of the IHR. We support the strengthening of focal points to enable them to carry out their role and responsibilities as specified in the regulations. At the same time, IHR implementation relies on several actors, also outside the health sector. Therefore, strengthening multi-sectoral communication and coordination is key. All efforts should be made to ensure that ownership by all relevant actors is enhanced. We appreciate uh, WHO Euro's initiative to support and facilitate twinning between member states in accordance with Article 44 of the regulations. <coughs> member states in the Euro region have made substantial improvements in IHR implementation and should be encouraged also to support others and less resort countries, both within and outside the region. We appreciate the work of the regional office to support and uh, operationalize new approaches for assessing the IHR core capacities with more action-oriented approaches through a combination of self-assessment, peer review, and external evaluations of core capacities, as well uh, as more emphasis on lessons learned, as in after-action uh, reviews. Good progress has been made on implementation of the new monitoring and evaluation structure of the IHR, as demonstrated by the number of countries that have conducted external evaluations and simulation exercises. We still recommend stronger efforts to ensure uh, that the results of these activities also are linked with costed action plans, with sustainable funding that can address all the identified gaps. Norway thanks the Secretariat for this report and on the status and the work of the Secretariat in uh, the ongoing implementation of the IHR in the Euro region. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now give the floor to Kazakhstan, followed by the Republic of Moldova. Thank you, Madam Chair. Kazakhstan supports 
the WHO efforts to accelerate implementation of the IHRs and also the strengthening of laboratory capacities for better health in the WHO European region. And we recognize the importance of work in this area. At present, we are working in accordance with our national legislation to implement a number of measures in this regard within Kazakhstan. We have established a working group, an intersectoral working group, that is assessing the situation in Kazakhstan and trying to identify certain weak points where there's a need for improvement to be made in accordance with the goals that have been set out in the international programme. In doing all of this, we seek to use the internal assessment tools made available to us by WHO. We are also very much involved in the International Network for Food Security and the Safety and Security of Food Products. And we seek constantly to be in touch with the WHO focal points when it comes to public health issues. Our focal point is uh, certainly to be found within the Ministry of Health and is very much involved in monitoring and using all of the experience that we have there. We also are able to use a database which allows us to be in touch with people from other departments and therefore to respond to any emergencies of a biological or chemical nature that might arise. We are very much involved in the exchange of information then involving different governing bodies and uh, we seek to do all that we can do also in being in touch with other public bodies who are concerned with food security and safety. Food safety is crucial for us because we do regularly monitor the quality of the food made available in our country. We also seek to work on immunization and vaccination in our country and uh, government resources are made available for that in accordance with the standards of the IHRs. We are seeking, however, constantly to upgrade the technology and the equipment that we have. When it comes to enhancing laboratory capacity, here within Kazakhstan we have laboratories that are involved in diagnosing communicable diseases and also involved in diagnosing the state of various food products. We are constantly involved in research uh, in accordance with the IHRs, particularly on 10 priority diseases that we seek to detect. We are therefore working very hard on that area also within laboratories in the country. We are focusing on particularly dangerous infections, viral infections and other kinds of infection. In particular, we have one particular laboratory that is involved also in flu survey, influenza surveillance and therefore is involved in using the necessary mechanisms there. Again, what we do is in accordance with our membership of a number of networks that are relevant in this respect. And looking to the future, to further implementation of the IHRs, we do have a roadmap that has set out a number of priorities that are in accordance with the priorities within the global plan. And this is, in fact, a programme that goes up to 2021. So we intend to continue to do more then in seeking to accelerate the work that we're doing in this area in accordance with international standards. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now give the floor to the Republic of Moldova, followed by Bulgaria. Thank you. The Republic of Moldova intends to carry out an internal assessment of its own national capacities in this regard and also to develop a plan of action for IHR implementation in our country with the support of WHO and also with the support of our Norwegian partners. We have already, together with the Norwegian Institute of Public Health and WHO, undertaken a certain amount of work in this area. An assessment in 2016 confirmed the fact that we are successfully cooperating with them in implementing the IHR, so we have made progress in that area. An overall assessment of our national assist, assist this system for identifying diseases and ensuring appropriate response to them is something that was considered as having moved forward significantly. We are in a position then to assess and detect all of the public health diseases that are on our list, that are on our inventory, and we have seen that we have made considerable progress in this area. This is true also in terms of the structural and non-structural resilience that we are able now to observe throughout our hospital and care facility system. We have an inter-institutional approach to these issues in Moldova, and thanks to that approach, we have a situation where everyone understands what they are responsible for and works together to ensure that medicines, medical equipment and medical materials are ready when required. 
And within the country, we have also created an intersectoral working group on AMR. And this is developing a national strategy on antimicrobial resistance and also a plan of action to ensure that it can be put into practice. And here we are getting technical support from WHO. And that is particularly valuable for us. We are working on this with the Ministry of Agriculture and Food, also with the National Institute for Food Security and Safety and a number of other bodies. In terms of the IHRs, we are also looking carefully at the way that we use antibiotics and we are trying to ensure that people are aware of the correct way to use antibiotics. This would apply both to professionals and to others. And we, in accordance with what has been supported by WHO, are also in a situation where we've been able to enhance laboratory capacity. And we have uniform documentation now being followed in all of the laboratories of the country in order to ensure that laboratories operate safely and security. We recognise, however, that we have to constantly seek to improve our preparedness and our ability to respond to disasters that may arise. And that being so, we are resolved to accelerate implementation of IHRs and also to further enhance the laboratory capacity that we have. As we undertake that process, we hope that we can continue to count on support from WHO and also cooperation with other development partners. We fully support this document, the document on the accelerating of the implementation of the IHRs and strengthening laboratory capacities for better health in the WHO. WHO European region. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. And I now give the floor to Bulgaria, followed by Greece. Madam Chair, Madam Regional Director, ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor to speak again on behalf of the nine member states of the Southeast European Health Network Albania, Bulgaria, Bosnia and Herzegovina, the State of Israel, Republic of Moldova, Montenegro, Republic of Macedonia, Romania, and Republic of Serbia. Over the last several years, our countries face varying national disasters, outbreaks of infectious diseases, as well as recent migrant crises and the Balkan corridor movements. The effects of the recent migrant crisis uh, and the consequent population flows provided an important opportunity to evaluate ourselves and our preparedness to respond. These challenges came in addition to our efforts to improve the health system performance and to secure equitable access to high quality health services in our populations. These developments only further highlighted an already existing need to strengthen the resilience of the affected communities to investments in this region. This situation entailed an adequate and coordinated respo coordinate response at national but also sub-regional level, and our region has demonstrated what collaboration and support means when response was provided to the floors in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbia and Croatia, and later in Bulgaria and Macedonia. We highly acknowledge WHO's support, which was extensive, both in response as well as in preparedness, taking lessons learned. The upcoming years will be crucial to achieve sustainable future, further, uh, future in our region and further upgrade public health services and capacities by establishing a Southeastern European Health Network platform on cross-border collaboration for public health services, including all hazard preparedness and response. We call on our governments and our major partner, WHO Regional Office for Europe, to work jointly with relevant stakeholders and interested pa parties to identify and recommend the most effective mechanisms to address this comprehensively health, environment and climate change. We also call in our neighbour countries and to other EU member states to join us and support us in the future as uh, public health threats do not know about us. Uh, our network is a proud partner of the work which WHO Europe is leading to safeguard, mitigate, prevent and respond to emergencies and natural disasters of any nature. In every member state of the network, there is much to do to advance sustainable development. It will be therefore important for all to uh, introduce multidimensional perspectives, involve the full range of stakeholders in national and local development, which incorporate pursuit of human development and environmental sustainability, and acknowledge the importance of addressing vulnerabilities and marginalization. 
I would like to use this occasion and express once again our true gratitude to the World Health Organization and in particular to its European Regional Office and the Regional Director, Dr. Susanna Jacob, to her tremendous support over the last decades to the Southeast European Health Network, which makes the region voice to be heard for supporting us to advance public health gains, our genuine aim and commitment to achieve the SDGs 2030 and our major objective to prepare better for, to respond to and to mitigate emergencies to which our region is prone. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. And I now give the floor to Greece, followed by Belgium. Thank you. Greece welcomes the WHO initiative supporting the member states for the implementation of IHR. The unprecedented increase in global travel through land, sea or air of our times points to the pressing need as member states and global society for public health security and protection. This is not only true for communicable diseases, but also for the transport of dangerous substances or biological, chemical and radiological agents. Greece is in a satisfactory level of implementation as regards IHR. Our public health service has faced the challenge of mass refugee migrant influx in the last years. We can now safely state that due to the mobilization of the Ministry of Health and the whole of government, there has been no major migrant health or public health crisis. Greece remains a safe country from the public health point of view. A specially designed syndromic surveillance system supported by the Hellenic CDC, covering the refugee migrant reception centers all over the country, provides real-time data for the mobilization of public health services and action. Thanks to the generous support of UNICEF, the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies and major NGOs, to whom we would like once more to express our appreciation and gratitude, our country has completed the first phase of an extensive immunization program for migrant refugee children with a primary set of vaccines. In addition, due to the current missile outbreaks in many European countries, measures are taken to ensure high MMR vaccination coverage in the migrant refugee children as well as the general population. At this point, we would like to join other member states in stating our anxiety for the equitable distribution of the global vaccine production to cover actual needs in every member state at a reasonable price. Our country is also privileged to receive every year an ever-increasing number of foreign visitors. The maintenance of health security for our visitors is always a priority for the Greek government. Despite the well-known financial constraints, Greece has not stopped the restructuring, the reorganization, and the support of the public health sector. In fact, based on a significant know-how, expertise, and infrastructure, our ambition is to be able to play an important role in the framework of the WHO European Regional Office or the ECDC. In this regard, the coordinating role of Greece in co-funded joint actions, project, projects focusing health security of sea, air and land transport entry points, as well as our continued participation in European fora such as the Health Security Committee manifest our commitment to face cross-border health threats, both communicable and non-communicable. Greece welcomes the WHA initiatives to support the Member States in implementing IHR through exchange of good practices and know-how, always respecting the international law and human rights or the native culture in each Member State. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now give the floor to Belgium, followed by Germany. Thank you, Madam Chair. Belgium believes on the crucial importance of the links existing between the IHR implementation and the building of strong and resilient health systems. But let me focus my intervention on an important step in implementing IHR in Belgium. Last June, Belgium received an international team of experts as part of a joint external evaluation to help us 
in identifying the most urgent needs within our health systems, in, the, in implementing core capacities of the international health regulation. We can safely say that all parties implicated in the process of the GE were positive, not only about the results of the mission, but also about the beneficial effect that arose from consultation of different national such stakeholders and bringing them together before and during the GE. However, Next to a series of beneficial elements, we also see that there is still room for improvement of the GE tools. Just to name some examples, the scoring mechanism could be improved. The tool should address financing issues per cluster rather than globally. The time of preparation for the GE is key and is as such of added value but the time foreseen in the process of the GE is too short and should be extended. Moreover, having the ambition to use one universal tool for all countries, independent of their level of development, poses certain challenges. Belgium will be happy to participate in further reflection on how to fine-tune the GE tool to participate in other external evaluation, and last but not least, to work on an implementation plan of action to address the recommendation from our joint external evaluation. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, and I now give the floor to Germany, followed by Austria. Um, yeah, herzlichen Dank. Um, Thank you very much. So far as Germany is concerned, implementation of the IHRs is something that remains a priority. And we would like to thank uh, the Secretariat of WHO for having provided this very interesting document on the topic. We recognize that special stress has been laid on the fact that Countries who are not as advanced as others require particular attention. Application of the IHRs, however, goes well beyond that. It's not just about strengthening laboratory capacity. It's an evolving process. When we think about implementation of the IHRs, we know that evaluation assessment is the first key step. And here WHO and its partners can act as a, a real catalyst in providing the kind of support that is needed. Thinking about the 2030 Agenda or Universal Health Coverage, all of these are issues that are intrinsically linked and linked with the IHRs. And that's why we need a multi-sectoral approach here. We welcome the fact that a framework for evaluation and assessment needs to be further grafted, taking into account a number of components, simulation exercises and external assessment. Germany has already supported such exercises involving specialists and consultants in the area, but that's just one thing that can be done to improve IHRs. And by itself it's not enough. As things stand at present, as the current chair of the G20, Germany has really given priority to management of emergency situations. We invited a number of colleagues recently to participate in a simulation that we were organizing, and within that framework, we are going to deal with various issues relating to national crisis management. In particular, we are going to look at the principles that underpin the IHRs. This simulation exercise is then, as I say, going to be based on a number of principles, which were published in July. A partnership-based approach is something that is very much advocated in this document. And indeed, the need to work with partners, with WHO and with others at regional level, 
is something that is extremely important and it is the right approach. We certainly intend to further strengthen partnerships and we believe that we need to consolidate certain institutions so that their global competence can be further recognised and extended. As we see it, WHO has a coordinating role to play in that respect and really has to lead coordination in accordance with an established plan. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now give the floor to Austria, followed by the Russian Federation. Thank you, Frau Vorsitzende. Österreich begrüßt das vorliegen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Austria welcomes this document and we wish to thank the Secretariat for it. Capacity building to allow us uh, to implement the IHRs better is part of the responsibility borne by member states. And of course, this will help to strengthen health systems. That's true at both global and regional level. At both levels, we believe that WHO needs to provide support through education and training, for instance. And for that to be done, we need a strategy. We would like to emphasize the importance of the pilot projects that have been suggested, the simulations. We think these can be very useful and they are foreseen within the plan. In November 2017, later this year in Vienna, we're actually going to have exercises of that type. Experts from member states and in particular from the Balkan, Balkans, from the southeast of Europe, as well as people from the European Commission will be involved in this simulation. The idea is to make people understand what precisely is involved in implementing the IHRs in particular scenarios. And here we think what's especially important is intersectoral cooperation and cooperation among member states. A number of steps can be taken to allow us to do more in policy terms, in different areas, and also in looking at the impact that we can have. We need to continue to work through the networks that we have, coordinated by WHO, and we need to do that more intensively. Coordination and the sim simulation plans, the pilot projects I'm talking about, are essential to make sure that we can get the plans right. And that's why we need external assessment and evaluation. The preparation process for external evaluation is a process, therefore, that has to be appropriately funded by all member states. Thank you. Thank you very much, Austria. And I give the floor to the Russian Federation, followed by Andorra. Thank you. Russia welcomes the work that has been done by Euro in seeking to accelerate implementation of the IHRs. The IHRs are the legal basis, they're a legal agreement on the basis of which work has to be done in many areas, and certainly we are very much aware of that. In going through this document, however, it's not entirely clear what the document's supposed to be. Is it a plan of action? Is it guidance? Is it recommendations? We, as member countries, what are we supposed to do with this? Let me recall that, in fact, in the 67th session of the WHA, we had a global plan for implementation of the IHRs that was not adopted because it was considered that at that stage it was simply a draft document not adopted by the Assembly. So when it comes down to practical implementation or operationalization of all of this at regional level, it's really not possible yet because it has not itself been adopted. However, we now recognize that we're talking here about a strategic plan for our, our region. We also know there's an epidemiological risk for the whole world, and that way we cannot simply stand idly by and be left out of what's going on. And we therefore need to have discussion on this global plan. Now, it seems to me that if we look at this document in detail, we would like to make a number of comments. It seems that we do indeed cover a number of difficult issues relating to implementation of the IHR, but not all. For instance, when we talk about recommendations for countries and specific measures that the Secretariat might undertake, this is not clear. The way that this is formulated is very difficult to understand. Things are rather mixed up. There's a certain amount of overlap. We need rather to have a list of specific measures to be undertaken and we need to understand who is going to do what so that certain goals can be achieved in the next few years. In addition, we need to note, when looking at the prior priorities, here one of them is listed as being that of improved monitoring and evaluation
information and reporting. However, it seems to us that in fact you can't have an initiative like that unless it is indeed adopted by all member states. And at present, when looking at the monitoring mechanism for the IHRs, here we're talking about something that's supposed to include an external evaluation. But it seems to us that at present that's simply not entirely appropriate or adequate at present, because you can't just have it as an internal evaluation or assessment, otherwise you're not going to understand where precisely you are. We also know that we're talking here about monitoring of, of uh, laboratory capacity and enhancing laboratory capacity in a number of ways. And here we have to look carefully at what is produced and we have to look at access to equipment, to diagnostic equipment and so on. In other words, it seems to us that when you look at things like risk, risk assessment and information about risk, again, this is not very clear. And what is meant here by close cooperation between Euro and partners? What partners are we talking about here? Again, things are not specified. This is not entirely clear. We support the work done by WHO and over the past four years we've made voluntary contributions to the work that has been done. In fact, these contributions have amounted to around six and a half million US dollars. And in fact, we also gave more than 10 US dollars, uh, in fact, to various bodies in our countries and in other countries, including Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Belarus, Turkmenistan and Tajikistan. Now, it seems to us then that a great deal is being done. And we also, however, think that this has to be made much clearer. We thank Germany for what they have done it's in ensuring that this is going to be discussed at the Hamburg summit. And we do recognize all Germany has done in its capacity as the chair of the G20 at present. We support further, con further discussion on this issue, both here and at other relevant international fora. We support what WHO is doing in seeking to accelerate implementation of the IHRs, and we stand ready to cooperate with Euro on this issue. Thank you very much, and I now give the floor to Andorra, who is the last speaker on my list. Andorra, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. Andorra welcomes the report of the Secretariat looking to accelerate the implementation of IHR as a framework that will allow member states to accelerate also to be more well prepared in front of international but also national emerging situations. I have the pleasure to announce that Andorra has signed recently a memorandum of understanding to enlarge the historical cooperation that we have with, with Spain and um, particularly an agreement that we signed two years ago uh, to cooperate in front transborder emerging situation and in particular in front infectious hazards that could need of a high complex uh, technologies to be diagnostic uh, and that means labs technology but also complex care deliveries that uh, we are not able uh, to provide in Andorra. Of course the will of Andorra is also to extend and enlarge this cooperation with all the neighboring countries and we are also keeping conversations and working with our French colleagues on the same sense. Andorra fully supports this document and the Roma proposed to accelerate the implementation of IHR. Thank you. Thank you very much and I would now like to invite Dr. Emi Roglu to respond to the comments made. Thank, thank you very much for the, such a strong support and commitment. It's, it's great to see the political commitment coming from the member states and also the country ownership to strengthen the capacities which is going to be able to detect all public health threats. Uh, and, and thanks particularly to certain country initiatives like G20 on with the Germany's support also financially, Norway, Russian Federation, France, are just a few countries that I could uh, list who have been really helping us. This is a true joint work with you and the Secretariat as well as the partners and then I will dwell on, on, on a few comments and, and questions that I will try to clarify. Uh, you identified the set of actions we suggest during the next one year, uh, ambitious but realistic, we take your notes. We welcome the commitment and, and support you're showing. And then you mentioned also the importance of the multi-sectorial and cross-border and international collaboration, and this is what the European region is planning to do. 
I did not list all the partners we are working, but at the national level, it's a broad partnership starting with the UN agencies, but also civil society, a lot of NGOs, particularly in, in terms of our response. But of course, also the European Commission uh, with its decision on the cross-border health threat. So this is in, in also re response to the question on, from uh, Russian Federation on, on the partnerships. And, and we commit to show the coordination role in, in implementation and coordination of that work. And then you also mentioned a number of different means to implement the IHR as well as the build capacities, and it's exactly as, as how we see it. Networks play a critical role. I didn't list them all, but one of them is, is welcome and acknowledge the commitment and the request for support from Southeastern Eastern European Health Network. But also we, we try to engage as much to the twinning and, and the bilateral agreements uh, are very much welcome, like the examples we have heard between France and Monaco and Spain and Portugal. This is the way to start with the small geographical areas and start building, uh, building up. Our focus is, is going to be the low capacity, high vulnerability countries, and of course we will continue the coordination role, and we will do this in, in engaging you all, because you are asking to identify the real capacities, and you see this as an evolving process leading to continuous improvement, and which is going to result in, in cost to national uh, plans. And, and uh, I welcome the suggestions of revising the tool, which we will discuss with the global level, of course, but I can commit that this will be an inclusive and transparent process, which is going to engage each and every member state and also going to address their, their concerns, which has been raised as like Russian Federation, which we take note of. Then you ask for continued capacity building. The good news is we will, we will continue. We are starting actually with another national focal points meeting kindly hosted by Germany next year. And also Italy's proposal for the laboratory diagnostics. We welcome the, uh, your proposal to collaborate. Food safety, as mentioned by Kazakhstan, and the One Health approach is an important aspect, but not only, only food safety. Actually, we try to make it as, as possible the linkages, which has been raised also by Moldova and Greece, like immunization is very much linked to it, and, and vaccine preventable disease outbreaks, as well as the vector-borne diseases that is being increasing in the region. Uh, and, and, and then the question from Russian Federation on, on the uh, nature of the, of the document, uh, as I was mentioning in my introduction speech, this is trying to cover uh, the period until we have a regional action plan, because the IHR action plan has been uh, due this year, actually. You, you will see the progress report in the implementation, and this was in response to the request coming from the member states last year. So we see it as a secretariat proposal for a set of actions until we have a clear strategy and an action plan which is developed on the uh, global strategy, which is going to be discussed tomorrow, and we are looking forward to your comments on that. So I think I will stop here and thank, very, thank you very much. Uh, we are relying on your support, and this will be an area we will continue to prioritize. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Emiroglu. There is no resolution linked to this agenda item, so we will now close this agenda item. And we will move um, to the governance issue, um, governance in the WHO European region. The relevant document is contained in EUR slash RC67 slash 14, and the resolution contained in document EUR slash RC67 slash ConfDoc6. For your information, the technical briefing will be held in parallel to this meeting and will start at 6 o'clock. 
Um, in room ACAD, and the, it, the technical briefing is on collaboration on health information and reporting between WHO European Regional Office for Europe, the European Union, and the OECD. And as I said, it will take place starting at six o'clock in room ACAD. And we will continue with our discussion on governance. So, Governance reform is a topic that has been high on the agenda in this region for many years, as well as in the regional committee itself, as in the standing committee. Jointly with the standing committee and the subgroup of the standing committee on governance, the regional director has developed a proposal for the regional committee's consideration on how we can implement the relevant elements of the, a global decision WHA 69, uh, 8 on governance reform in the European region. Dr. Jakob, you have the floor to introduce this topic. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry for this late hour, but as you may recall, we had to postpone this agenda item from Monday. However, this is a very important issue, and the governance reform has been of key importance for WHO, particularly in the European Regional Committee, for many, many years, and it has been high on our agenda. During the last year's Regional Committee, you requested me to present a report to you on governance to this regional committee, taking into account the regional implication of the World Health Assembly 69-8 decision on governance reform. The report that I present to you today is jointly developed with the standing committee of the regional committee, and I would like to thank specifically to the members of the governance subgroup of the standing committee and especially his chair, Dr. Svein Magnusson, for their excellent work and guidance. I want to highlight four elements in the report. First, the importance of the alignment between governance at the global and regional level. Secondly, the outcome of regional conferences. Thirdly, consultations on regional committee documents and resolutions. And fourthly, finally, strengthening the WHO cooperation with the countries. The World Health Assembly 69-8 decision on governance reform endorsed a number of proposals to enhance the alignment between the regional committees and the global governing bodies. This has been important for this region for many years. And each regional committee, as you know, reviews the decisions taken by the global governing bodies and the implications for our region during the discussion of the agenda item on matters arising from the World Health Assembly and the Executive Board. To strengthen the alignment between the policies at the global and regional level, I propose a case-by-case -case approach. However, to ensure full transparency and discussion at the regional committee, I propose to include in the report on the matters arising from the global agenda items in more detail whether and how the global policy requires adaptation to the regional context and what the programmatic and the cost implications are. This will allow you to review and comment on our proposals from the regional follow-up of global decisions. In some cases, we might need to develop regional policies and strategies. Any proposal for this will be discussed with the Standing Committee and will be included into the multi-year forward-looking agenda of the Regional Committee, which is presented to the open session of the Standing Committee. This will allow Member States to reflect and comment on items coming to any future Regional Committees. 
Of course, we will align our regional forward-looking agenda with the agendas of the global governing bodies. Finally, I would like to strengthen the report of the regional committees to the executive board. Often, this report gets very limited attention by the board. Therefore, we propose to develop key messages based on the report of the regional committee to the executive board to support member states during the discussions at the board. We have annually some high-level regional conferences, often discussing very important strategic and technical issues in a more in-depth manner. The Standing Committee has considered whether and under what conditions conference declarations or outcome documents should be referred to the Regional Committee. I am very pleased that the Standing Committee has decided to actively participate in the preparation of these conference declarations and in the process of presenting outcome documents to the Regional Committee. The report before you provides the process and criteria agreed by the Standing Committee to bring the outcome of these high-level conferences to the Regional Committee. The agenda item on the outcome of the sixth Ministerial Conference on Environment and Health, which was on our agenda yesterday and we finalized it this morning, has been reviewed by the Standing Committee, taking into account the criteria and the process agreed. Therefore, I am very pleased to see that this new process is already in action. Moving on to the third item, in preparation of our regional committee, its policy documents and resolutions are of utmost importance, and I value, value your input very much. Therefore, we have been consulting member states during the preparation of our policies and action plans. At the request of many member states, we are now working to streamline the process of consultation, and I propose to limit our consultation to two separate streamlined web-based consultations. The first one on all working documents for the Regional Committee. These will be open for comments for one month at the beginning of the year. The second consultation will be on the draft resolutions for one month after the open session of the Standing Committee in May. They will be presented for the first time in the Standing Committee, so after that one month will be available for Member States for consultation. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, I want to draw your attention to the WHO country presence. In line with the World Health Assembly decision this year, I presented to the Regional Committee a report on the WHO performance in the countries. The report includes an oversight of our presence in the countries and of our work in the countries. I will continue to provide this overview report to the Regional Committee. I also want to, to draw your attention to the presence of the heads of WHO country offices here at this Regional Committee and encourage you to engage with them. A technical briefing yesterday allowed you to learn more about their work. Finally, I want to thank the network of the national counterparts who are our main point of contact in the member states. They are crucial for our work in the countries. They oversee the technical implementation of our policies at the country level and provide feedback to the regional office. 
This short presentation only provides you with some key elements of the report of, and the draft resolution that is in front of you. And once again, Madam Chair, I would like to use this opportunity to thank the Standing Committee for its continuous guidance and support on these very important governance issues. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Regional Director. I know that governance reform is a very important topic in our region. And therefore, I now open the floor for discussion. Delegates wishing to speak, please raise your name plates. Estonia, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am speaking on behalf of the European Union and its member states. The candidate countries Montenegro, Serbia and Albania, the country of the stabilization and the association process and potential candidate Bosnia-Herzegovina, as well as Ukraine, the Republic of Moldova and Georgia align themselves with this statement. We thank the regional director for the SCRC for the continuous leadership on governance related issues and recognize that this work can benefit the entire the WHO. Implementation of decision uh, WHA uh, 69 8 on governance reform remains important in the European region. We need to keep building on process made to achieve organizational excellence with tan tangible uh, results on, on the ground. In doing this, we must assure that effectiveness, efficiency, transparency and accountability remain at the center of our action in order to face emerging, uh, emerging uh, challenges and deliver on our global health priorities. We are pleased to see that the integration of the global policies into regional level is central in our agenda and action. The multi-year rolling and forward-looking agenda planning has been essential for keeping our regional agenda and meetings manageable. Further, we are pleased to see that the increase in the agenda items has stopped we can now prepare ourselves better for meaningful and uh, focused discussions, including on the process, uh, progress reports. We should continue um, uh, strategic alignment of our work at the regional level with uh, activities and plans at the global level as closely as possible. We also highly value uh, the web-based consultations of documents, which allow us to provide early input. Still, there is room for improvement in the regional adaptation uh, of globally agreed strategies, and we reiterate our concerns about automatic endorsement of declarations from various uh, high-level meetings. The CRC uh, should make uh, uh, decisions based, uh, uh, case by base, uh, case based on clear criteria as described in the background document, page 22 to 25. We are ready to endorse the proposed modalities for the uh, SCRC involvement on how to include the future conference uh, declarations for the uh, consideration. However, we would like to get a clarification on what exactly is meant by officially appointed high-level government representatives in criteria 23C. We do have one uh, amendment to the, to the uh, resolution and I will read it out in the end of my intervention. We believe that the WHO country presence report deserves uh, more at attention as it is a valuable tool to understand the programmatic needs for actions and the resources. We renew our request for, for a forward-looking and transparent discussion on the strategic future of the country offices. Finally, 
uh, we emphasize that the governance uh, reform is a priority for us, especially now in the context of discussing uh, the 13th uh, general program of work. The European region has made great uh, headway on governance, but there is still more to do and we wish to see the work continue. Madam Regional Director, we, uh, the EU and its member states, assure you of our commitment, guidance and assistance along the pro pro process of uh, governance reform implementation. And now I read out uh, uh, the amendment to the resolution. It's uh, about the um, um, operative paragraph 7. Of the regional committee, please add the words based on the advice of the standing committee, so that uh, the sentence would read out uh, following. Decides that declarations adopted by regional conferences shall be considered only if the regional committee, based on the advice of the standing committee, is satisfied with the regional conferences, fulfill uh, the following criteria. Thank you. Thank you very much, Estonia, and I give the floor to Belgium, followed by Austria. Thank you, Madam Chair. Belgium fully aligns itself with a statement made by Estonia on behalf of the EU and its member states. We welcome the report on governance in the WHO European region. Good governance has long been one of our priorities within WHO. We are glad to see the subject remaining on the agenda, on global level as well as in the Euro region. We see numerous positive developments and best practices within the WHO Euro region a number of which could be shared with a global level. Indeed, as the WHO Euro region moves forward, we should not stop demanding WHO HQ to keep its reform efforts going. Belgium has observed impressive improvements, and we believe that there are still opportunities to improve the coordination between the activities of WHO Euro region headquarters and the European Union. Furthermore, most proposed resolutions will require additional funds. As just said by the new DG, we member states also need to res be responsible. Any adoption of a new resolution will have its implications, should become part of a global reflection on governance and should not be reduced to the mobilization of additional funds. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Belgium, and I give the floor to Austria, followed by Switzerland. Thank you. Thank you very much, President. Austria endorses the statement by Estonia on behalf of the EU and its member states. The reforms of governance in the WHO is a key topic, and we would like to thank the regional director for her report. In particular, we would like to thank the working group on governance, and we'd like to thank it for its commitment. Now, as for changes between the alignment of the regional and global levels, we deem the proposal in terms of content and topic to be very useful. And this is mentioned in paragraph 8. We support this proposal explicitly. Now, as for the conferences in the European area, this is a topic that has been been of concern to us for a long time. Yes, due to the increasing number of high-ranking conferences at a regional and global level, and at the same time we are we are seeing reduced personal uh, staffing resources at a national level, it's simply not possible for us to send representation. Now, we deem this to be a very important point, and we would like to call for a stronger mandate for the SCRC in terms of uh, the declaration of meetings. We take the opportunity for better consultations, and these consultations should happen early in the run-up to the conferences in order to adopt a specific position. And the meeting of the SCRC before the WHA in May is very useful as well. We call for... 
we call for the secretary to have more time to look at the comments from the web consultations. There's the uh, the closed meetings in March. And it's vital to maintain things at the appropriate level. In closing, I would like to make a comment with regard to global consultations. We think that the expertise of the Secretary is required when it comes to draft resolutions and this can facilitate the um, negotiation process. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Austria, and I now give the floor to Switzerland, followed by Monaco. Merci, madame. Thank you very much. Switzerland attaches considerable importance to governance reform within the World Health Organization. We should therefore like to congratulate the regional director and her team for taking a leading role in this question. As indicated in the report, Many of the recommendations made in Resolution WHA 69.8 have already been implemented by the region. There are a couple of remarks on two specific points in the report that I would like to make with your indulgence. First of all, we welcome the initiative of a concise statement during the Executive Board to present the main threads within the report. This, we think, will certainly contribute to better alignment between the three levels of the organization. Secondly, we'd like to thank the Secretariat for the online consultation of the various documents made possible before the session of the Regional Committee. We welcome this approach, which is aimed, of course, at bringing about a greater transparency and inclusion between and among member states, but we were a little bit worried about the additional workload that this consultation process might create for member states. After all, the middle of February is a period of intensive work, falling as it does between the conclusion of the Executive Board and the preparations for the World Health Assembly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Switzerland, and I now give the floor to Monaco, followed by Finland. Thank you very much. I'm also grateful to the Secretariat and to the SCRC for the work they have been doing following the previous regional committee. And we're also grateful for the consultation between the SCRC and member states. As to the proposals in the document, we have the following points to make. On the regional impact of global policy, Monaco has some concerns about this specific point, and we made them clear last year. The measures proposed in paragraph 7 to 10 of the report, however, are acceptable to us, and we hope they can be implemented quickly. We'll be able to measure their impact after a couple of years. On the alignment of agendas between governing bodies, we agree in principle with the measures proposed in paragraphs 13 to 19. However, it does seem to us to be essential that the member states of our region and the regional office should mobilize in order, above all, to improve rationalization, harmonization, and the breakdown of agenda items between the Executive Board and the World Health Assembly. That will perhaps stop the constant increase in number of agenda items which we've seen over the last two years, which constitutes an unbearable burden for both the Secretariat and small member states. As for the Executive Board agenda, the proposals in this report could be tried, but we think it's still necessary to make further progress with rationalizing agendas. If we don't do that, this practice will not have very much effect. As to declarations adopted at the regional meeting, the approach outlined in the document seems to us to be the right one, and we would support it. In conclusion, and turning to online consultation, we think this is a good initiative, but we have, again, to bear in mind small-sized delegations which may not be able to respond in time because of the very short periods of time made possible in the schedule. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monaco, and I give the floor to Finland, followed by Germany. Chair, I speak on behalf of Denmark, Estonia, Finland, Iceland, Latvia, Lithuania, Norway, and Sweden. 
At last year's regional committee, we requested a document with proposals on how to better manage technical documents and avoid duplication of work already done at global level in matters where regional specificities do not require it. We thank the Secretariat for the report and the proposals. Overall, the proposed approaches on the alignment of agendas between all three levels take us a step in the right direction, and we commend the regional office for this. Assessing the regional implications of global policies on a case-by-case -case basis is a welcome approach. The concrete recommendation to be presented by the regional office, including potential added value of adapting a global strategy for our region and the relevant regional specificities, will allow for a meaningful discussion at the regional committee. We would like to see this happen also in cases where a regional strategy is about to expire and where a new initiative is purely regional that is, in matters where no global strategy yet exists. Furthermore, the regional committee should always have the final word, a word on whether an outcome document of regional conferences should be endorsed by the committee or not. We appreciate the proposal for criteria in this regard, but stress that they first and foremost will provide standing committees guidance as input to the regional committees deliberations and not just a yes or no. Finally, Chair, we support all measures that facilitate to the point strategic policy debates at the regional committee meetings, including the limit of usually no more than eight policy documents at each meeting. We believe that keeping doc documents focused will also support this goal. We therefore propose applying the same limit to documents as for EB and WHA, with annexes as needed in addition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Finland, and I give the floor to Germany, followed by the Russian Federation. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I'd like to align myself uh, with the statement held by Estonia on behalf of the EU. Uh, we'd like to thank the Secretariat for the report and uh, obviously also for the, um, to the subgroup and the chair of the subgroup for the enormous work uh, it's been putting into the governance um, reform on the regional level. Um, our region is certainly um, a best practice example when it comes to uh, governance reform in WHO and uh, we'd like to thank um, the, the entire Secretariat and the RD for the um, transparent process in this regard. A specific thank um, we'd like to express on the country office report, which we find highly relevant. Um, yesterday, and I'd like to um, uh, stress this, we had an excellent uh, side event on the work of WHO in the country setting. Um, it was excellent. Uh, for many reasons, but one point that I personally felt uh, very, very good was to hear the voices of the heads of country offices um, and to hear from their um, work in the country setting. This is an issue which will become even more important in the near future as one of the key aims of um, the new DG is to strengthen the work of um, WHO in the country setting. The report of um, uh, WHO Euro on um, the work in the country setting clarifies that, for example, in our region, roughly 50% of the resources is spent and used in the country uh, setting, that um, I think 350 people are working in the country offices. So it's a, a major part of what WHO does is actually happening on the country setting. And most of us here in the room, at least me, myself, we are not aware of um, what exactly happens, etc. So I think it makes sense to um, provide us with more knowledge in order for us to be able to uh, provide our guidance on how to strengthen um, the country offices, meaning what, in what setting um, do they work, what resources do they have, what challenges um, do um, colleagues in the country offices face in order for us to provide solutions and our guidance. So I applaud the Secretariat for um, this workshop, for the report, 
we would uh, support to have uh, even more uh, knowledge on it. Um, I think that's a very, very good example, which um, hopefully also the um, Secretary in Geneva will follow. Um, and uh, maybe one could even include um, the idea of visiting um, country offices, maybe the, the subgroup or parts of the SCSC, in order to um, get a direct uh, view of WHO's importance uh, and relevance in the country setting. Thank you very much. Vielen Dank, Deutschland. And Thank you very much, Germany. Floor to the Russian Federation. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Regional Director, the Russian Federation appreciates what has been done by the European region to improve strategic governance at global and regional level and to enhance effectiveness. We are grateful to the SCRC and to the Regional Director for the work which they have done. The measures proposed in the document seem to be as to be appropriate and such as to enhance effectiveness and therefore we support their implementation. Cooperation and collaboration at regional level is very important and therefore we think we should have the same understanding of terminology, the categories we use, etc. This is very important for mutual understanding of decisions and to ensure we get the correct results from them. We would therefore be grateful to the SCRC for this to be reflected in the document. We would also suggest that the appropriate regional working group be set up and would be happy to participate on this. The same goes for the subgroup on strategic approaches to be taken at the next session. Thank you. Thank you very much to the Russian Federation. And this brings us to the end of our debate on this agenda item. And I now give the floor to Nedret to, no, to the RD to respond. Yeah, mm -hmm. so. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you for the excellent support and input that we received from you and obviously the guidance. And let me pick up on some of the issues that you have highlighted in the course of the discussion, starting with the statement by Estonia. I fully agree with you that this is a very important topic for WHO, both in the region as well as at the global level. And I can assure you that it will remain a constant item on the agenda of the European Regional Committee but the new Director General of WHO has also picked up the governance issues as an important global item, and therefore we are already working together to bring some of the best practices, good practices that we have in the European region uh, to headquarters, to his attention, and also to the global level. You also mentioned uh, the strategic future of the country offices. Again, this is a key issue for the Director General to strengthen the country presence, the country offices, and also to have further discussion on our country work and to have more impact in the countries. But a strategic discussion on the future of the country offices should take place in the global context, and we should not have a discussion separately region by region, because all these arrangements and the strengthening of the country offices need to be aligned. And this discussion is starting. We will have the first round of discussions around this topic already in the GPG this November, that's the Global Policy Group. I fully agree with you on the criteria on ministerial conferences and the declarations from ministerial conferences to the regional committee. I know very much about your concern about this issue. Therefore, we have developed clear criteria with the SCRC. We have tested it for the first time with regard to the Minsk conference, and then during this year with the Environment and Health conference, and every time we will discuss it at length with the standing committee and we will bring it to the regional committee only if the positions are fully aligned with a guidance document from the standing committee. Several of you have raised this issue and therefore I wanted to make this clear that this is the intention. And Estonia specifically asked that from the European governance experience, the whole organization should benefit. I already highlighted that, that yes, of course, we will further discuss it with the DG and make sure that he has all the information on what we have in the European region. 
Estonia also asked me about the unofficially appointed delegates, what it means. Actually, it is just an expression to further strengthen the idea that the representative must have received from their respective ministers the authority to fully act as indicated um, in the document. But if you think that this wording is not appropriate, we are very happy to drop it. This on officially appointed, because all delegates from a member states have to be officially appointed anyhow. There is no unofficially appointed delegate. So it is more to strengthen the notion, nothing else. Then um, Belgium uh, made a comment that we should further improve the alignment of our work between headquarters and Euro, as well as WHO and the EU. Full agreement with that. Recently, we have developed the document in the Global Policy Group on, the, on how to strengthen and how to empower the so-called category networks and program area networks, which cut across, across the three levels of the organization. In the technical areas, they are led by the ADGs, and that is what we put in place now also operationally, and I am sure you will see an alignment there. With regard to WHO and EU, we are working a lot with the European Union uh, from the European perspective. Every year we have a senior officials meeting both for the regional office and also for the global context, which again will be strengthened now with the leadership of the Director General because one of his key priorities is partnerships. And as I mentioned during one of the agenda items, his first trip led him, took him to Brussels during the European Development Days, and we also agreed with him that we will follow up on that. He will pay a high-level visit to the EU in Brussels later on this year, and we have started the preparations for the next senior officials meeting um, for next year, which will be a global meeting, but in that context, we also have a European regional perspective. So that's something that is already in place. Of course, we can further improve the alignment, and we have to, but quite a lot is already on their way. Um, Austria, again, referred to the outcome documents from the conferences, but also to another issue, which is very important and close to our heart, and that is the fact that we should limit the number of conferences and meetings that we are organizing. And again, WHO has a, a convening power, therefore one of the important tools that we have in our hands is meetings and conferences, but we fully agree with you that we should not overdo it. And during this extraordinary GPG that we had in Geneva in August, we already took this up and we said that we need to have some sort of plan not only in Europe, but in the whole of WHO, on the conferences that we organize, and to make sure that they don't duplicate with each other, they don't overlap with each other, and we have some sort of plan for the next six months. So we are starting to work towards this end, and one more element in this is also that we are also limiting the number of staff who is going to various events, and they need to have some sort of visible role in an event in order to get the approval. And now there is a head of delegation and the deputy head of delegation, and the deputy head of delegation has the role to check whether the members of the delegation uh, have to go and whether there is any justification for them to go. Okay. So with this, we try to... Report that the others weren't... And I think it would be helpful that they internally report about the meeting, that those who did not attend know what, what was going on at yeah. a special event. That is already in place, actually, because we have a reporting obligation, and normally your next travel is not approved unless you submit the report. So I think this is how it works. I'm not sure that we always follow this, but in, in practice we do have it in place, and, uh, and we have to enforce it. I agree with you. 
Uh, with regard to the Switzerland's comments, two important comments. One is the concise statement from the regional committees to the EB. We fully agree with you. Now we present a report in writing, but there is no statement. So what we plan to do is to come up with some important bullet points, either for the president or for the European members of the executive board, who can then have this concise statement, and we have to develop the how we do it, do it, but normally the issue is that we should report back so that there is more alignment between global and regional agenda also in the executive board. Uh, with regard to the web-based consultations, again, several of you have raised it, saying that it is an additional workload plus the timing is too short. Well, on the timing, the issue is that we have to submit our documents very much on time, four to six weeks before the, the various events, six weeks before the regional committee, but three weeks before the standing committee. And as we have three standing committee meetings in, in a year, five standing committee meetings in a year, therefore we are always constantly running to prepare documents. So the timing is pretty much limited when we can reach out for web-based consultations, but we try to extend this timing as much as possible. It is not really possible for us to change the spring a time for the consultation of the documents because then we miss the May standing committee, the open meeting for which we normally take finalized documents, and then with the guidance of the standing committee in May, we finalize the documents and submit them to the regional committee. So we are very much bound by the strict deadlines of the governing bodies. Um, but we do our best, of course, and, and as much as possible, we will extend the deadline. And then for the resolutions, that was a request from the regional committee of two years ago in Lithuania, that we should have a four weeks consultation also on the resolutions, which we do after the open meeting of the standing committee in May. We leave it open for one month before we finalize them for the uh, regional committee. Uh, I already commented on the issue that Finland has raised to ask for guidance of the standing committee um, for the declarations and, uh, and outcome documents from the major conferences. And I promise you that we do our best to align the regional and global agendas. And last year in the regional committee, there was a plea to us, I think it was from Netherlands, that we should limit the number of policy issues that we submit to the regional committee to five. And I committed myself to this five, so it's not even eight. Uh, so we try to work within this range and try to limit it as much as it is possible. Uh, Germany raised the issue of um, the country offices, country performance, country presence, and it's true that half of our staff is in the countries, half in Copenhagen and in the GDOs, other half in the country offices, and this is a huge asset for us. We are happy to report back to you on the performance of our work in the countries, but we do it in an integrated manner as part of the technical topics that we bring to the regional committee, progress reports and all this, that includes both the inter-country aspects of our work as well as the country implementation. So the country performance is pretty much integrated in its nature. But I take your point that we should also give more visibility to the work of the country offices, the country presence, what we do in the countries, how we operate in the countries. And this will be even more relevant now with the new reform process that is starting within the UN family, where again we have to link the various uh, UN agencies and our work and integrate them more uh, for the SDG implementation. So I think your input, your guidance in that will also be very important for us. And again, uh, I agree with you that the presence of the heads of country offices is an asset here. And maybe some visits to the countries by SCRC members, regional committee members, is quite helpful. So for example, when we take uh, the uh, standing committee to Georgia now in November, there will be an opportunity to show you around 
in the country office of Georgia and to explain how they work, what is the staffing, what they do, how they interact with the minister, how they reach out to the other ministries, how they work with the higher levels of the government. So it provides a good opportunity and thank you for this advice. We will take uh, full account of this. And, um, and um, I think that that will be an, an, a very high priority item for us to discuss the strengthening of the country offices. And in, at the end of October this year, very beginning of November, there will be a global WR meeting in Geneva led by Dr. Tedros, but of course all regional directors will be there and all WRs from the 140 countries where we have WR offices will be there. And that will provide us a great opportunity to discuss many of the strategic issues, uh, partnership issues, uh, UN reform, the future of the country cooperation strategies and bilateral collaborative agreements. Like today, for example, the Director General spent at least one and a half, two hours with the European head of the country offices uh, to seek their views that we can then build into the global WR meeting. So many of the issues that you have raised are work in progress. And thank you for all your comments, for your great support. And I promise you that this will be a high priority for us and we will continue to report back to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Regional Director. And we can now consider the adoption of the proposed draft resolution contained in EUR slash RC67 slash ConfDoc6 Ref 1, draft resolution on governance in the WHO European region. There has been one amendment proposed to the draft resolution. Is the committee willing to adopt the draft resolution as amended by consensus? I see no objections. The resolution is therefore adopted.